Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very thankful that I get to present for you this fine, fine spring day, it seems like. And because most of you don't know, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael Ware. I am a master's student here at Indiana State University. I am currently working on my master's in language studies and TESOL, and I'm currently a sort of and currently an instructor for the ESL program here at Indiana State. And I want to present an article to you that probably not many people consider when it comes to the world of linguistics and language studies. Because this article, as you can see from the handouts that I've provided for you, is bilingualism and autism, and can they work together? So if you notice in your handouts on the second slide, I have some questions for you guys to think about during our discussion today, which is, would you raise your children bilingually? That's our first question. And if the answer is yes, then what are some drawbacks, but what are some benefits? Second, would you still raise them bilingually should you find out, for example, that they have been diagnosed with autism, Asperger's syndrome, or Down syndrome, anything that would be qualified as a learning disability? And then finally, what is autism spectrum disorder? Because not many people really know about it. Not many people have a very clear concept of what it is. So this research actually comes from research that I had done last spring, because I was interested in learning about bilingualism in autistic language learners because when I was two or three years old I learned that or I was diagnosed rather with Asperger's syndrome and we'll get to what it is specifically later on in the discussion and I wanted to learn about other language learners such as myself and how I was able to achieve proficiency in Spanish but the thing is is that this article goes back a little farther to two people I want to introduce Bolmer and Bialystok. Bolmer, in his article, states that prior to the 1950s, many, many people thought that those diagnosed with autism or Asperger's were considered demonic and even insane. Now, the reason for that is because autism is a spectrum, but there are some who do have it, such as myself, who can speak more or less fluently or, more, or pretty well. And then on the other side of the spectrum, there are those who cannot speak at all. They are mute, which is why they were considered insane and demonic in many pop culture, many pop cultures and folk tales of the time. Bialystok, on the other hand, looked at autistic, not so much autistic language learners, but just language learners with disabilities, and she focuses on two things: analysis and control. One thing that autistics or those with learning disabilities sometimes have a problem with are the facts of abstract concepts such as freedom, liberty, justice. And they have a very hard time grasping that. And this is what Bialystok refers to as analysis. So they were trying to capture these abstract ideas. Bialystok also mentions control. Control is then paying to specific attention, which for those with ADD, is very difficult. However, with Asperger's, sometimes it's very easy for us to latch onto a very specific point, and on the other hand, it's very difficult. So those are just two people I want to introduce into this study. And parents, when it comes to autistics or those with learning disabilities, they want the best for their children. We all want the best for our children, those of us who are called to be parents and those who are not. And and in regards to languages, they want their children to be fluent in both languages. What I mean by both is that they want their children to be fluent in their native or heritage language, as the article refers to, or as well as their additional second or foreign additional languages as well. The problem is that there's a lot of misinformation and disinformation when it comes to learning about all of these things. They have a very skewed idea of career benefits. They have a skewed idea of perhaps a pride in their own language, their heritage language. And they also are worried about what's called semilingualism. Have any of you guys heard of that? I didn't think so. It's a pretty rare term. It's a pretty unusual term. And actually, I had never heard of it until I read this article. Semilingualism is essentially 
if their child, if a child who perhaps does have autism spectrum disorder or Asperger's or whatever, if they're struggling with their native language along with an additional language, so for example, in this article it's Chinese and English, so if they're learning Chinese but they're struggling with it, and then the parents want to incorporate English into their language learning, the, there's a very strong possibility that they're not going to be able to be fluent in either one, which results in semilingualism. So, if you look on the next slide on your handouts, the method that was used for this research is somewhat interesting because they use three interviews, each ranging from 60 minutes to 90 minutes in length. And there were really no set questions in regards to what was being discussed. And all the interviews were later recorded and transcribed. The requirements had 10 families, but each of them had to have at least one child with autism. Six had autism spectrum disorder of some sort, and four had Asperger's. And Chinese was the primary language, so the heritage language which was being incorporated. And then English was, of course, the second one. The age of the children, however, was one problem that I had with this presentation, or with this article, rather. The majority of these kinds of experiments, or these kinds of articles, when it comes to looking at autistics, have only been done on children from age three to, I think, eight years old, which really doesn't give you much insight as to language learners and their progress afterwards. So, for example, even looking at middle school or even high school or hopefully even college. But one thing also depended on what was called um, guaxni. I think that's how you say it. It's a native Chinese cultural relationship where there's this kinship or this referential kinship going on where the parents want to transfer their language onto their children and so on and so on. And one, so the study found four different things. First was language priority. What they felt was that English was a prestigious language. In fact, this is a quote from one of the parents, or the parents who participated. If he could only learn one language, I would rather he learn English. I think English is easier and it influence is wider. There are so many parts of the world that use English. He could go anywhere in the whole wide world. That's why we decided to stay, because we wanted him to learn English. And again, this was because of this kinship referential system that's going on. So the first thing is language priority. English had a very strong priority. Second, English was considered a tool for intervention. So obviously parents want the best for their children, but they didn't see English as the ultimate goal. What they saw English as was just a way to get to that goal. It just helped them. But all of the parents felt that autism or potential defer preferential deficit disorder, which is PDD, or sometimes called, also referred to as Asperger's sometimes, they felt that Asperger's or autism was a barrier. It limited their children from learning any additional languages. And in fact, this is a quote from another mother. I was anguish anxious because Kenneth was so late in talking. My logic was simple. Being good in one language was better than being bad at three. And so again, all of the parents actually came to the United States because of the services that were offered here for their children with some kind of learning disability. And again, because of the misinformation and disinformation from professionals, some were telling parents to start immediately teaching their child English. Others were saying, don't do this, this is a terrible idea. And even teachers were saying, go ahead, start teaching English to your children so that way they can catch up. So everybody had different views all across the map. But most of the parents, as a result, they spoke without interpreters. They had studied English prior to moving to the United States. And oddly enough, they didn't really want English. Again, they considered English as just being a tool to help them go to their ultimate goal. They preferred Chinese. In fact, most of the parents never used English. They always used Chinese. And in fact, if their child was struggling with what, was, what we called earlier semilingualism, they would do a lot of code switching, so they would switch from either Chinese into English or vice versa. 
But personally, I had a lot of problems with this study. And I had, as you can see in the final page of the handout, what I've always been very perplexed by is many of these studies look at only the mother and the child. That's it. They never incorporate the fathers, for example, if both parents are involved in the raising process. Second, we don't really even know the socioeconomic status of the participants involved in this study. Now, obviously, we can assume it's fairly, fairly affluent because moving from the United States, coming here, getting a house, finding a job, obviously that requires a substantial amount of money and resources. So we can see that it's easier for them to move here, and they probably are fairly well off. But the problem is we don't, we, we don't consider those of the lower income or maybe just the middle income. And we also don't think about the particular age. This is one thing that's very troubling. When I was doing my research last year, I read in a study from George Washington University that at least 80%, 80% of autistics drop out of college. 80%, and this is because of many reasons, but the majority of them is that professors just don't understand. They don't understand their students, they don't understand their needs, and as many as 80% drop out of college. I'm not even sure that it's, I'm sure that that's changed now because this study was done back in 2007. So I'm sure that the numbers have fluctuated and probably increased in all honesty. And the problem with this study is the parents were interviewed, but the children weren't. Why? That's what I don't understand. Why were the children not interviewed in this? I just have always, I kind of wish that they had just recorded the parents interacting with each other, with their children, or the caregiver with their children, so it would seem more natural and we would actually have a little bit more of an insight. And again, most of the information that the, that the parents were getting was all hearsay because the professionals don't even really know what's going on. And again, it didn't take into account the parents and the children. So, those were my concerns or my questions from this presentation or this article. And I want to open the floor up now to you guys as to what you think is important, if you have any questions about my learning, about my research.